welcome back everyone. Thank you for spending the day with your marketing and communications community with APGA. Our next pre presentation um, is by Mindy Bianca, Principal at MBPR. And she will be presenting insights into how to grow your PR program. Mindy began her career as a print journalist with an interest in feature writing and a particular passion for writing about travel. Shifting to a public relations career in late 1994 on what was supposed to be a temporary basis turned out to be a perfect, permanent fit. Over the past 22 years, Mindy has shared fascinating stories of destinations and travel-related businesses from all over the world. Now she runs her own PR agency focused on media relations for destinations and tourism-related businesses. So, without further ado, please welcome Mindy Bianca. Good morning, everyone. Oh, and here I'm trying to share my screen, and that's not working. So we might have the, the gang at Longwood Gardens pull up my presentation. <laughs> Hold on. <laughs> here we go. Got it. <laughs> okay. So good morning to everybody. I think I might be the, the speaker today who is – uh, not an employee of a public garden, but I am a user of public gardens. Um, my parents are both avid gardeners, and from the time I was a very small child, every vacation always included a stop at a garden if there was one nearby. So on behalf of my entire family, thank you for giving us excellent experiences and some great travel memories over the years, and inspiring my mom, who after sending two kids to college, um, went back to college herself and got her degree in landscape architecture so that she could really do up a garden the right way. So. Um, so thank you on, on, on behalf of your visitors for delivering excellent experiences. Um, so you got a little bit of background on me, um, and, and just think, I, I know that all of you have many, many things on your plate, many different, you wear different hats, you do a lot of different things. A lot of you probably are dabbling in marketing as well as public relations, as well as social media. Um, and as was said in my introduction, I pretty much devote myself 100% of the time just to media relations. So my entire job is spending time talking to journalists, trying to encourage them to cover stories about our clients, um, and kind of getting to know where they are, what's going on in the world of journalism these days. And of course, my background as a journalist helps me in that way um, to have those very real conversations. Um, so I'm hoping that I'm going to be able to give you guys some insight. You certainly know the basics of public relations, but I hope that I'm able to give you some insight into, in 2020, how can we be making those media relationships work the very best advantage um, to all of us. So if I had to boil it down to everything that I know about public relations and share it in just one sentence, it would be this. Your mom was right about absolutely everything. And I say this sort of in jest, but it's also incredibly true. If you take the basics of public relations and boil them down, it's really the rules that your parents taught you when you were a kid, how to behave. Um, you know, mind your manners and be polite. Sometimes the media can be really annoying, and sometimes they can be brutal. Sometimes they can be very negative, and the, you, you just have to kind of smile and nod and be as polite as you can be and muddle through. Um, say please and thank you. Um, if somebody does a great story for you, say thank you. If you want someone to come out and, and cover something in your garden, make sure you're, you're saying please. Extend a polite invitation. Um, play nicely with others. Be a good partner to other attractions in your community. Be a good partner to your local convention visitors bureau or your state tourism office. Um, reach out to the new kid in class and say hello. If you see that there's a new journalist working at the local TV station or a new person joins the morning show at a local radio station or maybe there's a new reporter who's covering the, the calendar section of your newspaper or local magazine, reach out, say hello, introduce yourself, be friendly. Um, if someone asks you for something, fulfill your promise. If you say you're going to do something, do it. And perhaps most importantly, don't be selfish, share. And um, we'll talk about that in a little while. It's not all about you. And the more you're willing to share the spotlight with others, probably the more likely you are to get some great PR. 
So those are just some of the rules of the road. Let's talk about where things are in the world of the media landscape right now. Um, things are kind of grim, if we're being honest. Um, as a former journalist, it makes me very sad to see what's happening in journalism today. I'm very old school. I'm a person who loves to hear the funk of a newspaper hit my front doorstep in the morning. I'm a person who enjoys carrying around magazines and reading them. Um, I am a very, like, I, I just, I, I like to hold on to things as I'm, as I'm reading them and digesting them. I know that that's not how modern people do things. Everybody does everything online and digitally now. And that's being reflected in the way that magazines and newspapers are being run. So it's harder and harder to find outlets to share your story because a lot of the outlets have just changed dramatically in the past few years. Every form of media is going through significant changes right now. And those changes impact all of us as as marketing and public relations professionals. So we have to know how to adapt and change with the times and work with and engage the, the media as it's working today. In the last 18 months, a lot of titles of publications that I really love to work with, all these guys pictured on the right side of the screen, those folks have either gone out of business or they've gone to online only outlets. And if you look at the left side of your screen, that's how people are digesting their media information these days. Um, and, and it's a different kind of way that you have to pitch these folks. Uh, the speed at which you have to get to them is very different. So what do we need to do? Um, my, my general theory is you have to pay attention to the seasons and know that different kinds of media work in different kinds of seasons. So you've got television, you've got radio, you've got newspapers, you've got magazines, you've got digital media, you have social media. Um, honestly, as the, the way that we all work, we have to kind of speak all those different languages. It's almost like we have to be multilingual and communicate with each type of media the way they need to be communicated with. And that can be really hard and a little overwhelming because we only have so many hours in the day. And each and every journalist wants you to, to approach them as if they're the only journalist that you're ever approaching. In my case, we approach thousands and thousands of journalists every year. And so we really try very hard to figure out what is everyone's particular need, how do they need to be communicated with, um, how do we treat them as individuals while also doing our jobs and eventually you know, shutting down shop for the night and going home. So for print publications, for magazines, and even to some degree newspapers, but particularly let's think about magazines like your local lifestyle magazine, your local city magazine, or you know, if you have your, sets, uh, your site set on something really big like you know, a, a monthly periodical like Better Homes and Gardens or something like that, for that kind of publication, Stories these days have a longer shelf life. They have to be what we call evergreen. They have to be a story that lasts over and over and over again that doesn't really have um, a, an end date to it. So when you're pitching those kinds of outlets, you have to be thinking long term. And you have to maybe give up on the idea of having perhaps you have a special event um, and you really aspire to have that event that maybe takes place for a month or three weeks in one of these, these long lead outlets, they may not be very interested anymore simply because they're going much more toward these evergreen, long-lasting stories. If you do have an event, if you do have something short-term, the place where that can go is the digital side of things. And you know, a lot of those publications, a lot of those long lead glossy magazines that probably were the perfect place for your gardens a few years ago, mainly because you had great photography and they really, really took advantage of great photography, um, a lot of those publications now have a digital side and that is probably where you should be pitching things like events and anything with kind of a shorter lead. Um, and, and often you, you might think that it's the same staff doing the print edition and the digital. It's actually in most cases two different staffs. You might think, well, they're under the same banner. Clearly they're talking to each other. Actually, they're often not. So just because you went to one side, you know, like the print side of a publication with a story idea, doesn't mean that the digital side knows about it. So in some cases, you may have to be pitching to two different people at an outlet with the same name because they may not even be in the same office building. They may not even be in an office. These days, virtually you know, tons of media just work remotely. They work from their homes, and so they're not even in the same office space as people to just over lunch or passing through the office share an idea. Digital stories are going to be quicker to produce, 
but journalists don't spend a lot of time on them. It is like a never-ending cycle for them. As soon as they file one story, their editor is throwing another story at them. So a couple things happen with these short lead public, uh, publications or, or websites. One thing is, unfortunately, there's not always as much accuracy as you would like. And that's really challenging for us as public relations and marketing professionals because we, we are so concerned about making sure that anything that is consumer facing is accurate. We want to make sure people know what the ticket price is. We want to make sure we, people know which hours things are happening. And a lot of times those things get mixed up or messed up in a digital story. The good news is that they're pretty easy to fix digitally. And so if you can go to the journalist or the editor in a very polite way and just basically without kind of being persnickety to them, obviously you want the information to be correct, but if you remind them that they also want the information to be correct, usually they'll change those things for you. But what I'm finding is increasingly the more work you can do for a journalist, the better off everyone's going to be. And I'm not suggesting that journalists have become lazy or incompetent, anything but. They are overwhelmed and overworked and constantly being, you know, just things are being thrown at them left and right. So I really try to formulate as specific as information as I can give them so that they have all the details they need. I also respond to a lot of leads and queries all day, every day. My team is just looking out there for who's looking for what kind of story. And so uh, a lot of times we'll give them, you know, you, it's this fine line. You want to give them comprehensive information, but you don't want to give them so, inf so much information that you bore them or that you, they, just, they, they just disconnect. They're like, you know, I, I don't have time. You know, think about your attention span when you're online. Think about the average attention span. It's not very long, so you don't want to inundate people with a lot of information, but you do want to give them enough information and more than your competition so that if they're choosing between you and something else, that they don't have to go back to you to ask for more details. They don't have to go to you to ask for, for photos. That you've kind of given that to them all in one place and that you've provided the information so that you know it's accurate. Um, so just remember, no one has an attention span anymore. So you've got to make your pitches very snappy, very creative, quick and fun. Um, I discovered, I mean, I'm a, I'm a very verbose person. I love a paragraph. Paragraphs don't work for the media. Bullet points work. So if you're trying to get a point across and you're sending an email, rather than doing it in, in, you know, in sentences and paragraphs, consider just doing a quick introduction sentence. Here's who I am. Here's who I represent. This is what I wanted to tell you about. Bullet point, bullet point, bullet point. Here's a link to photos. Please let me know if you have questions. Um, you know, the quicker someone can get through your email and decide whether it's helpful to them or not, the more likely they are to use it if it is indeed helpful. So you know, our world as, as public relations practitioners, as marketers, as people who are working with the media and hoping that the media will help us share our stories, they become really, really difficult. Um, you can just see from these headlines, I mean, what is happening? Who is left to pitch? Who is left to share your stories with? Well, there are plenty of people. Um, probably a lot of them are former editors, people who were let go from all of these magazines that have closed. And I say that sort of in jest, but it's very true. I mean, I am, of course, friends with a lot of editors that I have known for more than two decades who in the past couple of years, their, their magazines have been shut down or they've gone strictly digital. Those people have now become freelancers. And they're very desirable freelancers because they know how to write, they know how to edit, their work comes across pretty clean to whoever it is they're writing for. So a lot of what used to be editors or editorial staff have torn, turned into freelancers. And so my suggestion would be a freelancer could be your best bet. These are folks who have a lot more flexibility than somebody who's on staff. Somebody who's on staff at a newspaper, magazine, or even a TV station may not be able to leave the office and get to you. But a freelancer probably can. Um, so you can actually have personal interaction with a freelancer. And many of them will, will figure out a way to tell your story. You know, freelancers are, are hungry. They need to eat. They need to be paid. So they're going to come out and they're going to spend time and they're going to try to get to a really great story with you because it's in their best interest as well because they want to sell that story to an outlet. So I'm, I'm just going to suggest that maybe you do a Google search on freelance journalists in your town or your city and see who's out there 
and see if maybe they have an interest in coming out and seeing you and, and if some of the outlets that they write for could be appropriate outlets for you all to be approaching. Uh, you know, it's, it's also not unheard of that there could be a freelancer in your backyard who writes stories for a national outlet. Uh, I used to be the PR person for the state of Maryland's tourism office, and I knew all the freelancers based in Baltimore because I knew that if I had a story that I needed to get to a national publication really fast, the best way to do it was going to be call one of my local freelancers. And they were close, so I didn't have to put them up overnight. I, there was not a whole lot I had to do for them except for show them where the story was and make sure that they, they had what they needed to tell it. So I would really recommend trying to see if you can find freelancers in your local area who might have an interest in you. Um, I'll also say a lot of people, both freelancers and editorial staff, are going to write a story without ever visiting. And as a person who works in the travel industry, I, that's really hard for me. I'm a big believer in seeing is believing. I think that the very best stories come from people who have had personal experiences, who have been out there to see how, how your guests are you know, having experience at, at your facility. But sadly, a lot of people just don't have the time or the, the, the budget to get there. Um, so we're having to, our, our jobs are even harder sometimes because we are trying to get people to help us tell our stories when they don't even know what our stories are. So we're really responsible for trying to educate them about things. And this is where things like a really great website or really awesome press materials pay off because if someone can't physically come out and see you, at least you can give them fulfillment pieces that hopefully will help tell your story in the best possible way. So how do we figure out where your story belongs? Um, you know, you have to kind of survey the media. And you, know, you look at this photo on the right and look at all of those magazines. I've sort of painted a grim picture of what's going on in journalism, but that's not to say that there aren't a bunch of magazines out there still. There aren't a bunch of newspapers out there still. There's tons of websites. There's all kinds of television programs. People need content. So it's kind of our job to figure out, we're like matchmakers. We know we have a story. We have to figure out who's the best person to tell that story, what's the best outlet to share that story. And so you kind of have to do your research. Um, we, on, on our staff, we have two people. Their entire jobs are research. Um, let's say, for example, we have a client who, well, uh, one that's coming up right, right in a couple of weeks is Valentine's Day. So we have clients who are like, hey, we have Valentine's Day packages. Get these out there. So our researchers go out online and they look to see, okay, which, which outlets are talking about Valentine's Day deals and travel? Um, which outlets have, have written about Valentine's Day travel in the past? Um, and they not only pull the story, they read the story and they say who else has been included in it. Um, because if they were included last year, there's a good chance they'll be included again, but sometimes the media wants to change things up and they don't want to include the same folks again. Um, we also dig through who's the journalist who wrote this story. Do we know this journalist? If we don't know this journalist, let's reach out and introduce ourselves to that journalist. So there's a lot of research involved, and I, I know how busy all of you are. And when do you have the time to do that research? It's really, really hard to find the time. But if you have a message that you think is really important, I urge you to do a little research and figure out the top outlets that will help you tell that story. Um, and before you pitch it to somebody, again, do your research and make sure that they haven't covered you recently. Um, and that sounds kind of silly because you're thinking, well, I'm kind of in charge of the message, so wouldn't I know if they covered us or not? But I have one client who consistently comes to me and says, oh, we really need to be in this outlet or we really need to be on that TV show. And I learned very early on in that relationship with that client, I had to do my research because it happened to me twice where I went to a journalist and said, I have a perfect story for you. And they sent a note back and said, well, it is perfect. That's why I told that story last year. And I had to go back to the client and say, well, wait, if they told the story already, why are you asking me to go to them again? Oh, well, we thought it was time for people to know about us again. Well, on a national news outlet, they're not going to tell the same story twice in 12 months. That's just not going to happen. So make sure that you take that extra step to be positive that the person you're approaching or the outlet you're approaching hasn't recently written about you or hasn't recently talked about you on the air. You also want to figure out who is the best contact to connect with. Who seems like they would be friendly to my cause? And so for example, let's say you want a local TV station to come out and spend some time at your garden. 
So, you know, maybe listen to the anchors chatter. You know, sometimes they'll talk about what they did over the weekend. Did somebody mention that they spent their weekend in the garden? If so, maybe they are into gardening and maybe they would be a person to approach. Um, you know, do you ever hear a reporter mention something about their kids? If they have kids and you've got a great children's program, maybe that's going to be a friendly audience. So you kind of want to study the media and figure out who's the right person for me to connect with. Um, so here's another example. You, you also want to know who not to connect with. And for example, in my career, I've worked with a lot of zoos and aquariums. And those zoos and aquariums are very popular with a lot of family-oriented journalists. There are a lot of people who are opposed to zoos and aquariums. And so we have gotten in the habit in our department, we always look at people's social media feeds. We see, you know, if, if they are Facebook friends with PETA, we're probably not going to invite them to the big event at the zoo or the aquarium because we don't want to upset the apple cart. We don't want to offend anyone. So we just try to take those extra steps so that we know that we're getting to the right person. So that extra minute of research you do could be the building block for your future. And I will say, once you've figured out who you think the right person is, no matter how high ranking they might be, be fearless. Just reach out, say hello, introduce yourself, say hello. Um, I did this several months ago with Craig Melvin, who is one of the anchors of the Today Show. Um, he is from South Carolina. I have a lot of clients in South Carolina. He talks about South Carolina at least once a week on the air. He is passionate about his home state. Um, I saw an interview with him in Garden and Gun magazine. And in that interview, which was only two pages, I think he mentioned South Carolina five times. So I just reached out and sent him an email and I said, hey, you know, love everything you're doing on the Today Show. Also saw your interview in Garden and Gun and just wanted to let you know how much the people of South Carolina appreciate how much love you have for that state. You know, I represent some of the littlest, tiniest districts in South Carolina, and it's really meaningful for them to hear you say loving things about their state when you're on the air. And he sent back the most lovely note and was just very kind and very thoughtful. And he said, hey, you know, anytime you need something for those clients in South Carolina, you let me know. And I didn't have a need for him right then. Like, I'm not going to cash in that chip immediately. But when the time does come to cash in that chip, I will find that email, recycle it with him, remind him who I was, and see if he indeed can be helpful to those clients. So if you think you've figured out the right person to talk to, go ahead and start the conversation. Be brave. You'll be surprised often by the response you get. So let's say you have figured out who the person is and you want to kind of create this relationship. Uh, and remember, you're looking for long-term relationships with the media. You want to um, – th this is not going to be quick overnight. This is going to be something that takes place over time. I will tell you my general theory on, on reaching out to strangers who are in the media who you think could be someone that you might want to work with in the future. Flattery can get you everywhere. Sending them a note – after you've seen a story they've done on television or you've heard them interviewed on the radio or you've, you've read a piece online or in the newspaper or magazine, reach out and say, you know, that piece was really impressive. I, I really liked it. It really spoke to me. Take a look at recent projects they've been involved with, and if the mood strikes you, compliment them. Now, I want to give you this caveat. You have to be genuine in your outreach. The, the media can, can smell BS a mile away. Do not be disingenuous. Do not be insincere. Don't say something just because you're hoping to get a response from them. You have to be genuine. And I find it's often easiest to do this when you have nothing to gain, when you're, you literally have just seen something that you like and you're just telling them that you like it. And that could be the way to establish a relationship. As a former journalist, I can tell you I did not get a lot of positive feedback, both you know, from my editor and from the general public. Um, so when I got positive feedback, I certainly sat up and took notice. In fact, I haven't been a newspaper reporter for 25 years. I still have a folder of what I call my happy grams, um, notes and letters that people sent me when a story really, really impacted them. When I told a story and it made them cry, or I told a story and it made them sit up and take notice and do something. I love those letters, and getting that feedback was so, so important to me. And so I know that journalists very rarely hear the positives. 
So when you take a minute to compliment somebody's work and tell them, hey, nice job, it's probably something they haven't heard from anyone but their friends in a long, long time. And so it can be really meaningful. So I'm going to give you an example of how this really paid off for me. Um, I, up until a couple months ago, subscribed to National Geographic Traveler. I can no longer subscribe because it's no longer a print edition. Now I get it online. But um, I used to get the print copy of the magazine, and I would carry it around with me, and I'd read it on airplanes, and wherever I was, I just loved reading the magazine. And several years ago, I saw a story about um, a special kind of brownie that they have in British Columbia, Canada. And the story, I mean, I'd had a brownie like that when I had been in Canada, and I loved it. But this little blurb in National Geographic Traveler, it was written with humor, and it was written with passion. And I was like, oh my gosh, this is simultaneously funny, and also I think I'm going to talk to my husband tonight about booking flights to British Columbia so we can have an experience there and make sure we eat one of these brownies. And so I reached out to the journalist and I said, you know, your story just really struck a chord with me. It was funny. It was passionate. It was, I, you wrote a love letter to a brownie and I, you're my people. And there was, I, I had no reason to reach out to her other than to say, I loved your story. And she sent a note back, and we started to talk, and she was like, oh, you know, I see in your email address, you run a public relations company. So we got to know each other. She asked me who clients were. Um, we talked about the funny things you eat when you're traveling. And a few months later, I had the opportunity to coordinate a press trip to Norway. And I sent her a note, and I said, so I remember you say you like to eat local cuisine and interesting weird things. How do you feel about reindeer stew? And she sent a note back, and she was like, I'm in. When are we going? And so then we started to travel together. And over the course of time, we forged a really lovely partnership and a great friendship. And it has led to her coming to some client destinations of mine that I don't think she ever would have considered going to. But she trusts me now. She knows I'm not going to steer in the wrong direction. And she has great experiences in our destinations. She has won one of the biggest travel journalist awards ever for writing about one of our destinations, which certainly made our destination happy, but also you know, made us happy for her. So we've created this bond. And it all started over a story about a dessert in British Columbia. And you know, there was nothing for me to gain in that conversation that day. But think about all the things I've gained over the years. So I will say, you know, when you've established a relationship, once you have their ear, check in with them occasionally. Don't waste their time. Don't just check in with them and waste their time, but check in with them every now and then and just say hello. And maybe you do have something that you want to talk to them about. You know, hey, I just wanted to put this on your radar screen. I know you have kids. We're starting this new kids program. I would love for you to come out as my guest, um, have the experience. Uh, you know, please let me know if that's something that's interesting to you. Just try to remember to continue that conversation. And it's, you always have to straddle that line. You don't want to be annoying, but you want to be helpful and friendly. So we've probably all heard the, you know, the concept of the elevator speech where you have to be able to encapsulate your message in a couple of sentences. The, you know, for the length of an elevator ride, how do you sum up whatever it is you're trying to say? So you have to get your pitch down to a few sentences that you can fire off at a moment's notice. And we actually do this in my, in my team. We, you know, we practice with each other. We've got 21 clients, so we practice with each other. Okay, quick, elevator speech for Cooperstown, New York. Elevator speech for the Space Needle. Like, what, what are we saying? And so you kind of have to practice it so that you've got it down to a science. And for you, it might, just, it might be you've got an elevator speech for your facility as a whole. You've got an elevator speech maybe for a new exhibit or something new that's happening. You have an elevator speech for a certain kind of programming that you do. Maybe you have an elevator speech about the special people who work with you. Maybe you have an elevator speech about the kinds of guests you attract. But have those things down to you know, the bare couple of sentences because you don't know when you're going to run into a journalist or somebody else that is going to need to process that information in that way. I'm going to advise you to think like a journalist when you are planting these seeds. Journalists are told and they're trained from the very beginning, you are to answer the questions who, what, when, where, why, how, and not listed on this street post sign here, how much. Quantity, numbers, those really, really matter to the media. So make sure that you're answering those questions in your pitch. Have that information handy. Who, what, when, where, why, how, and how much. And speaking of how much, 
the lesson for all of us to take away is less is more. Don't overwhelm them with details. Keep things very short and sweet, whether you are on the phone with them, whether you're in person with them, whether you're sending them an email, whether you're tweeting them, whatever it is you're doing, keep it short and sweet. And you know, we as humans, I think, have a tendency when we're telling a story, we want to lead up to the big news. We want to lay the foundation, and then we want to hit them with the ta-da, and journalists don't have time for that ta-da. So you cannot bury the lead. You have to get right out there in the front and say, this is what I want to tell you about, and then provide the backup information. So don't lead up to it. Put the big news right out front so they can hear it, and then let them ask questions or provide the supporting evidence but you kind of want to do it backwards from what your natural inclination. If you were telling a, a story to a friend, you might draw it out. You might draw it out and then hit them with the punchline. You can't do that in most of your media pitches. So let's talk about what a story idea is. Where are they coming from? Where are you getting story ideas from? Um, you know, I always tell my team, people make the place. We represent a lot of destinations. We represent a lot of small destinations in the southern United States. It would be very easy to blur the lines and just be like, well, they all have terrific fried chicken and wonderful, friendly people. But it's those people that really make the difference. Um, people really make a thing a thing. So, you know, we live in the United States where we can choose where we live and we can choose where we work. And so my theory is people have chosen to live in these places. So they're passionate about these places. So let them help you tell the story about that place. In your case, people can choose to work at your facility. So there's something that draws them there. There's something that they love about it. So rely on your people to help tell your story. Figure out who your colorful characters are. You know, is there somebody who is a docent who maybe this is their second or third career? Maybe they were a school teacher who used to bring kids to your garden as part of a field trip, and they loved it, and they were inspired, and said so they wanted to come back and give up their time. Um, maybe there's somebody who started working there when they were 16 years old, and now they're 66, and they've spent their entire career there um, because they're just passionate about something there. Um, you know, the the journalists that you're working with are going to find the people who are not you and me far more interesting to talk to than the marketing representative or even the CEO. They want to talk to the people who are there doing the work, doing the stuff. Um, the second thing I'm going to tell you is quirk works. The weirder you've got, the happier the media is going to be. So if you have something unusual or offbeat or the largest collection of something or the tallest sunflower or the, the oldest, the newest, the rarest, whatever qualifier you have, that's going to be interesting to them. I will tell you, um, probably our most successful public relations campaign in my 25 years of doing public relations revolves around a goat named Betty who is at one of our resorts in Jamaica. And how she got to the resort is, I mean, if you think about Jamaica and you think about goats, often goats are on your plate. They are often curried and served as a lunch or dinner. Um, so in Jamaica, it's an island, so they try very hard not to be wasteful, and so they have a lot of green initiatives. And so the resorts often have partnerships with farmers where the resorts take their excess food and give them to the farmers to feed animals. And then that's kind of an, an economic relationship. So the resort we work with has a partnership with a pig farmer, and they take their kitchen scraps and they give it to the pig farmer, and he gives it to the pigs. But there is still a, a monetary value. And so I guess at one point they gave the, the scraps to the farmer, and he didn't have, he didn't have enough to, to, to make it an even exchange. So he gave the chef at our resort a goat. And I think he probably figured the goat would end up in a stew. Well, the goat turned out to be more like a dog than a goat. She's incredibly friendly, very lovable, likes to get on her back and have her tummy scratched. She is a very dog-like goat. And so the chef was like, clearly, we're not serving her for dinner. She is she's a, she's great. Like we have to she, we have to hang out with her. What are we going to do with her? Well, what do you do with a goat? Goats tend to brambles and brush and this resort is in a jungle so they gave the goat to the groundskeeping crew and so the groundskeeping crew 
kind of kept her with them while they were working all day. She would take care of part of the field. They would take care of part of the field. And any time guests would walk by, she would stand in the field and scream until they would come and visit her. And she loved to be petted. So then guests were like, well, you know, we're going to the wedding of our friend. Can we take Betty as our plus one? So then this goat starts showing up at all the wedding ceremonies that are taking place at this resort. So it becomes one of these things where suddenly everybody wants an audience with Betty. And so the resort said, well, if everyone wants an audience with Betty, maybe we do lunches with Betty. Maybe we, you know, we do other interactions with Betty. So here we are three years later. Betty has, uh, she, they got her a friend. She officially had a wedding ceremony um, so that we could promote the weddings at the resort. She's had many babies. It's an adults-only resort, but we always talk about the only kids allowed at the resort are Betty's children, and she has become part of the brand of that resort. If you Google search Jamaican resort with goat, you're going to find Betty, and you're going to find plenty of pictures of her, and that is quirky and weird. Like, that's just weird stuff, and we have gotten the attention of everyone from Lonely Planet to USA Today to talk about this, this goat who um, has kind of transformed this particular resort and some people stay at that resort strictly because they've read about Betty the goat. That's a, an example of a quirky thing that really, really paid off. And it was so funny because when they first told me, I was actually at the resort when they said, you know, so do you want to see our goat? Like it's the weirdest story. This, the, the pig farmer gave us a goat. We didn't know what to do with her. We gave her to the groundskeeping crew. She loves us. And I went out and I saw her and I looked at them. I'm like, you guys, this is your story. Like, this is it. I know we've been trying to figure out what sets you apart from all your competition. Here she is. So think about the quirky stuff you've got going on. Uh, my last piece of guidance is think outside of your own flower box. Like, it can't be all about you. Um, you know, think about the number of roundup stories that you see these days, the number of stories that are not just about one place, but around uh, many places. Or there are a lot of like best fried chicken in each state or best place to take kids on spring break in each state. So you're probably going to be paired with other stuff. So get to know your friends and your competitors and be ready to talk about them. So that's why a group like this one that you all belong to is really, really great because it gives you people like you, facilities like you, that you can compare notes with. And I urge you to put aside the idea of competition and think about collaboration instead. That has really been a benchmark of my career as a public relations practitioner. Um, I, you know, I knew who my competitors were. When I worked for the state of Maryland, my competitors were Washington, D.C., and Philadelphia, and the state of Delaware, and Virginia, and I got to know all of their PR people and figured out ways that we could work together and share the media. Um, so try to do that. If you can prove that what you've got going on is part of a trend, you're going to stand a better chance at getting your story told. At USA Today, they had this, this, this theory that you know, one was interesting, two is a coincidence, three is a trend. And when you have three, when you can prove three, then you've got a story. And I will tell you this as well. If you're the person who pitches the story, more than likely you get the lead paragraph of the story and you get the photo. So you want to be the person who comes up with the idea, but you might need to turn to your friends to, to prove the trend, but then you pitch it. Because if you pitch it, nine times out of ten, the media is going to remember that you're the one who pitched it and they're going to give you the photo and they're going to give you the lead. Um, so as an example, what if your garden just started doing like nighttime tours or moonlight walks? Find out who else is doing that and then pitch that story to some outlets that you think would find that interesting. Also, while you're trying to find partners and collaborators, try to be what I call geographically correct. You want to represent a cross section. So, for example, I, write, I, I, I pitch a lot of national stories. So for me, if I'm pitching a national story about one of my clients, and say my client is in the Midwest, then when I'm looking for people to collaborate with, I'm looking for somebody on the East Coast, I'm looking for somebody in the Northwest, somebody in California, someone in Texas. I'm trying to, to spread out the, the, the story because that's what national media is doing. National media isn't going to want a story strictly about everything in the southern quadrant of the United States. They're going to want uh, geographical diversity, so I try to provide that for them. So let's say you have captured the attention of the media, and let's pretend 
for all intents and purposes, this photo, it's, it, this is of two people strolling through a garden. Let's pretend this lady on the left is a reporter and this lady on the right is you. This is you walking a reporter through the garden. Um, you want to cultivate the relationship with the media and make yourself invaluable to them. So how do you do that? For starters, you anticipate their needs. Um, my team knows rule number one, think like a journalist. Now, most of them have never been a journalist, so I have to kind of explain to them what that means. Um, but think about if you were a journalist visiting your facility, what kinds of things would, would make you take interest? What would be interesting to you? What kinds of questions would you ask? And then you need to have those answers ready to go. So again, this is where your who, what, when, where, why, how, how much comes in. If you haven't had the opportunity to walk a lot of journalists through your property, I urge you to find a friend or family member who doesn't spend a lot of time at your facility to do a walkthrough with you and see what strikes their fancy. See what captures their interest. Because sometimes we're so close to the story, we can't see it. Sometimes we're so used to something that it doesn't seem special to us. So it helps sometimes to have an extra set of outside eyes look at things before the journalists come so that you can, in turn, anticipate the journalist's needs. Fill them with facts. Um, you know, there's, if you are old enough to know what the TV show Dragnet is, you know, just the facts. They always want just the facts. Facts are really important. And as we discussed earlier, a lot of times the media gets the facts wrong. So we want to do everything in our power to help them get the facts right. So I find it very helpful to have information written down and ready to share, especially when you're going to deal with numbers and technical things that the average person isn't going to know. And I think that your kinds of facilities fall into that category. I mean, everyone has seen a flower or a tree, but not everyone knows the name of that flower, that plant that they really love. They certainly don't know the Latin name. Um, they don't necessarily know all the sciency stuff that goes on behind the scenes at your facilities. So write it down, spell it out for them. And you're not dumbing it down for them. You just can't expect everyone to have the same level of knowledge about these things that you and the rest of the team at your facility have. So writing it down is really helpful. It also helps the journalists save face if they don't know how to spell something or if they don't really understand what you're talking about. Having it written down means that they don't have to actually ask the question so much as they just have to look at the information you've given them. And you can send them some information via email. You can hand it to them when they come to visit you. You know, I know that we are supposed to be green, and you know, maybe we don't want to use paper as much. But I will tell you this, in all of my experience, all the years that I've been doing this, when journalists come on site, I always have a piece of paper for them because it's something that they can easily reference. It's something they can scribble their own notes on. Even if a journalist takes notes on their iPhone, I find that often they're scribbling notes on the piece of paper I give them. Um, it, it, they'll use it. They will use it. Um, it's much easier than giving them a thumb drive and being like, here's all the information you need. Well, while you're walking them through the garden, they're not probably going to be able to access that thumb drive and get that information. So give them that piece of paper. The last tip I have for you here is get the picture. Have images ready to go. I will tell you the number one reason that any of our clients ever gets rejected from a story if we've pitched it is because we don't have appropriate photography. Um, we, we chapter and verse tell our clients all the time, photos, photos, photos. We just have to have high-res images. We're a very visual society. These days, I mean, so many stories will not run if there isn't an appropriate photo. So if you don't have a photo or if you don't have video, your pitch as good as it is, your story, as awesome as it is, may not resonate with the media. So in my experience, most gardens have excellent photography. It's something that you guys have because, I mean, you're beautiful. So people are often taking photos, and, and that's great. Most gardens have great photography. If you do not, and if you're in a situation where you are really constrained with budget and you maybe don't have the budget necessary to bring in a professional photographer, I encourage you to do a guest contest. This works a lot. Um, we have a lot of clients who have very low budgets. They do photo contests, um, and the, you know, the arrangement is that they get all rights to the photos, whatever wins the contest. It's a great way to build your image library. It's a great way to make your guest feel like they are a part of your success. Um, it, it can really work beautifully. So I do suggest that if you don't have a great photo collection. Um, we probably all remember the story of the tortoise and the hare, the whole idea of slow and steady wins the race. 
Um, so I'm going to tell you, slow is not going to help you. <laughs> Steady will. So I want you to be the fastest tortoise. I want you to be very deliberate. I want you to be very accurate. Get your information together and be right the first time, and then try to be as quick as you can. Um, too often, too many times, a PR person in a hurry is not going to provide correct information or accurate information. Um, and you know, it is a race but it's a race where both speed and accuracy matter. So I really, really encourage you to be as quick as you can when you're talking to the media and, and helping them, but also be accurate. You don't want to go back later and say, oh, I'm sorry, the information I gave you was in fact wrong. That makes you look silly. Um, and if you, let, let's say a journalist, you, you're on the phone with them or they're at your facility and you're walking through with them and they ask for something, either a piece of information or an image that you don't have on hand. Say, you know, that's fantastic. I'm happy to get that to you right away. And then get back to your office and do it right away. Let's say you're walking somebody through the gardens. The gardens closes. They leave. Rather than getting in your car and leaving, go right back to your office and do whatever it is you told them you were going to do. So it is waiting for them when they get back to their desk. So you have to be fast, and then you have to be patient, which is really hard for me. I'm not a very patient person. But you have to wait while a story or a project is coming to fruition. You have to give it some time. I'm not lying when I tell you I have a story about the island of St. Croix that I've been waiting for for two years. And I know it's going to be amazing. It's in a great publication. And it just keeps getting pushed because there isn't really a timeliness to it. And remember we talked about evergreens. The story is an evergreen, which means every month if they have something that seems a little more newsy, they're going to push our evergreen story. It's okay to check in. I have on, on my calendar, like I check in about that story maybe every three months just to see where it is. And I know it's still on the editor's radar screen. I know it's still going to be published. It's just a question of when. So it's okay to check in and to stay in touch. You just don't want to be a pest. Um, so I also, you know, I've just spent 40 minutes telling you how to get to know the media and how to befriend them. But I want to warn you not to get too cozy with them and to never let your guard down. I have great relationships with the media. I count the media among my friends. However, I also know where there is a line. Uh, and it's not so much in what we do now. I mean, I work in the travel industry. You guys work with public gardens. Uh, it's not like we've got like inner secrets that we really can't share. But be very cautious about what you say, and not only the words you use, but your tone and your body language. Um, you know, I for years have worked with the amusement industry. I work in theme parks. And you know, a lot of times a story, a happy story about something great in a theme park, a new ride or whatever, suddenly takes a turn and they want to get into safety. And you have to be ready to answer those questions, but you also have to, um, you, you have to be aware of your facial expression. You have to be aware, like, if you shrug your shoulders or if you, like, let's say you're in the garden walking through and, you know, telling the journalist about something and your, your boss walks by and you roll your eyes. Not a cool move. Um, like, let's think that, you know, maybe the journalist is going to think, oh, I wonder what's going on with, with this person. And so you just have to be very conscious of you, whatever it is you represent, you represent that all the time when you're with the media. Even if you're at a social function, even if at your, you're at a dinner where you're there and the media's there, just remember there, you're always on. And don't, don't forget that. Um, your goal is to become a forget-me-not. Your goal is to make yourself so invaluable and so unforgettable to the media that they will rely on you, that they will refer to you, that they look at you as an expert. Um, it's taken us a long time in, in my industry, but these days when journalists need something, they know they can come to my team and me and we will get it for them right away. So if something falls through, this happened last week. We had a journalist who was supposed to be doing a story about a Caribbean destination, not, not one of ours, um, and the resort she was staying at called her at the last minute. She was supposed to get on a plane in a couple of weeks, and they were like, yep, we've sold your room. We can't host you. And you know, there's a four-page feature that's being held in a magazine for this journalist's story. And she came to us and said, oh, my goodness. I need a resort fast, like, and I know that I can rely on you to help me. If, you, if one of yours isn't available, I know you know people in the industry who can help me. I've, I've, you know, I've got to satisfy my editor. What do I do? We love being that public relations agency. We love being that public relations resource um, because that means that we're invaluable to her. That means that she knows to call us. She knows 
that we will help her and it means that it will benefit our clients in the long run. You know, when, when it's all said and done, when you've courted the media, when they produce the story, when they've come out, when they've done a piece, make sure that you send your thanks. Tell them how much you appreciate it and share that story widely. Whatever the, however the story is out there, whether it's online, magazine, whatever it is, share it on social media, share it through every channel you know, because journalists are judged by their editors on how many clicks they get and how much interest seems to be being generated by the stories that they've placed. So show them your appreciation by sharing the story and getting it the clicks that they want so that they are there another day to write another story. You want to do whatever you can to tell them how much you appreciate them and keep cementing your relationship. Um, and if you think about it, that all goes back to what we talked about, um, you know, saying please and thank you. It's what your mom told you to do. Um, so keep that in mind. So that's what I have for you today, and I'm happy to answer any questions that you have. Thank you, Mindy. Um, we definitely got some great tips from you on pitching to print and digital, long lead and short lead pitches. Um, and I especially appreciated the genuineness that you need in your messaging, because um, like you said, um, you know, they can smell, you know, a phony uh, pitch, um, like a shark in the water. So um, that was definitely some great information. Excellent. Happy to share it. Um, okay. Our first question is, do you feel having a media event and inviting numerous journalists at once is appropriate, or is it better to invite journalists on an individual basis to keep it more of a personal experience? Um, I believe in both, and I think it really depends on the magnitude of what it is you're sharing, what it is you're revealing. Um, so I'm going to pull back to my career when I used to be uh, the PR director in Hershey, Pennsylvania. So anytime we had a new ride debuting at Hershey Park, we always did a full-fledged media event. We always brought all the local media out. We brought a lot of regional and national media out as well to ride the ride and to hear from the designer and to hear from the engineer because we just knew, I mean, most of our media events had, I'd say, 40 to 50 people at them. So it was a lot of people. If we had tried to do 50 individual visits, that would have been mind-numbing. Um, and most of them were going to be looking for the same thing. They wanted to get on a ride, have the experience, talk to the same people. Um, but if you've got a smaller number of people, and you feel like, okay, that outlet is going to be more interested in the human angle. This outlet is going to be more interested in the scientific angle. It might be better to do one-off individual visits. Um, so it really kind of depends on what kind of news you're trying to share and how many people you're sharing it with simultaneously. Um, but all of that is you – should, you should treat everyone you know, personally. If you do a big media event – um, make sure that you and other members of your team are around to kind of interact with every member of the media that you've invited so that every member of the media feels like someone from your team has spent some time with them. And that's what we would do. I mean, even if we had 40 or 50 people at a Hershey event, I had a staff of seven at Hershey, and we would actually pull in our peers from marketing and other departments so that everyone felt like they had had some time with an employee from Hershey who could help them along their way. So. I don't think there's a right or wrong answer to it, and I think both formulas can work, but at the heart of it, in, in either case, make sure that the media feels that personal touch from you guys. Great. Good points there, Mindy. Um, and also in running an event, you know, making sure that everyone on your staff is um, equipped with all the right information as well, because if Absolutely. a reporter has a quick question, you know, it, it's great to make sure that everyone is um, up to date and has all the information. For sure. Um, okay, what are some tools that you would recommend to use for PR? Whether it's searching for media, sending releases, um, any tools that you can recommend? Yeah, you know, it's very funny. Um, nothing I can recommend heartily. I will tell you what tools we use, but I will also tell you that that when I go to public relations conferences, one of the number one topics of conversation is how much we hate the media tools <laughs> that are available to us. Because none of them really does the job as much as we want them to do or as well as we want them to do. So um, my team uses a product called Cision, and that's what we use to build our lists. 
and to research media, but I will tell you that probably 60% of the time we find what we want and the other 40% of the time we don't find what we want on Cision. Um, so it, you know, it, it, sometimes it can solve your problems, sometimes it just creates bigger problems. We also use Cision as one of our press release distribution services. But again, it's, the releases are only as good as the list that we've built, and if we don't feel great about the list we built based on the resources there, maybe they're not great list. We also um, we have our own proprietary list. We have our own customized list of media that we know and that we love and that we work with who have asked, you know, please keep us posted on everything that's going on with your clients. So we have our own proprietary list, and we send out a lot of news to that list through MailChimp. Um, and so we use that as our, as our secondary distribution service. Um, you know, a lot of people monitor media. We, we have very small clients with very small budgets, so a lot of them don't want to pay for media monitoring. So we don't, you know, like Cision and Meltwater offer media monitoring. We don't actually pay for media monitoring because our clients don't want to pay that additional money. That means that our researchers are scouring websites every day. We're constantly doing Google searches. We all have Google alerts. We have um, a system called TalkWalker, which is also free, that you can plug in your, you know, your search terms, and every morning you'll get a TalkWalker alert. So we try to do everything we can at as little cost as possible because our clients don't have big budgets. And, um, so we've, we've tried to make sure we can do as much as we can while spending as little as we can. Um, so most of the services we use are free, but we do pay for Cision. Um, and I will say we pay too much for Cision. <laughs> but, uh, and we did a lot of searching, and that was the least of the evils for us. That was the system that seemed to work best for us after we did a bunch of analyses on their competitors. Great. Um, and how important is organizational buy-in in terms of um, providing resources for public relations? Incredibly important. And so I'm going to pull from my Hershey history again. When I first got to working at Hershey many, many years ago, um, they had not had an on-site PR director. They had had a large PR agency in New York City. and. I don't know that the relationship was really a two-way street. And so there were a lot of people, a lot of the upper echelon, the, you know, the highest ranking officials in the company, who really didn't have a lot of belief in public relations. They didn't really see the value in public relations. And so when I first joined the staff, I went around and I met with all the head honchos, and I kept hearing the same things. You know, public relations is always a burden on us. They need us to open up the park early because some TV station needs to be here at 5 o'clock in the morning. Or, you know, they always want us, you know, our chef needs to make a meal at a certain time. And, and so they looked at public relations as a burden, and they never saw the results. And so it was really a matter of trying to re-educate everybody and make sure everybody understood we're all in this together. I can't tell these stories without your help, but you should see the resulting stories, and you should feel appreciated for helping me with them. And so over the course of time I was there, I think we did a 180-degree change in people's perception of public relations. And I used to say to my team, you know, each of you guys is here. One of you represents the park. One of you represents the chocolate spa. One of you represents the garden, and one of you represents golf. I am the public relations person for public relations. It's my job to be your cheerleader. It's my job to educate the people that we report to about the value of public relations. And that meant I had to change the way I speak. I, I work in words. I love words. Words are my currency. But that's not how the big wigs, the CEOs, and the treasurers speak. They spoke in, in, in numbers. And so, and they spoke in money. So what I had to do was take our PR efforts and convert them over to numbers. I had to show them, here's how many journalists we brought into the destination this month. Here are the number of stories we placed. Here is the value of those stories. If we had, buyed, if we had bought ads in the same places that these stories ran, this is how much our marketing department would have had to spend. And so I, we took it and we made everything into numbers. And suddenly, the guys sitting around the board table took a very active interest in public relations. I also made sure that we were very good friends with our accountant, and I made sure we educated our accountant about who we were and what we did. And I brought the accounting department to our media events so they could see 
why we were spending thousands of dollars on, you know, hot dogs for people. Um, you know, they got to see the interaction and they started to, they worked the media events with us and we had their buy-in so that when it came to budget time, I had our accounting guy sitting next to me saying, I have seen what this has done. I see the positive results. I think we should just give her the money. Um, so it, it took a long time, but it was an educational process. But the more buy-in we had, the more C-suite people who believed in what we were doing, the easier it was for us to get what we needed to, to do the job right. Great. Yeah, and it's so important to be able to showcase, um, you know, the results that um, PR for your company is bringing in. And like you said, you know, it, it can be hard to show that, but a great way to do that is through numbers. So some great advice there. Um, how important is social media? Um, in the PR world today? I think that depends on who you're talking to. So I will outwardly admit I am not a big fan of social media. It's not how I as a person prefer to communicate, so it's not how I as a professional communicate. And we are a very old school public relations agency where we don't actually do public relations for our clients. Part of that is because I'm a big believer that your social media relationships should be, um, they should be as close to you as possible. Like I feel like they need to be real and live and authentic. There are a lot of agencies that will do your social media post for you, but I don't think that a social media post I do about our resort in Jamaica is going to be nearly as authentic as something that someone at the resort in Jamaica does. So we don't provide social media services. However, we have a lot of clients who really, really rely on social media. So we work in partnership with social media experts, either on staff or um, at another agency, and we make sure that all of our messages are aligned. Um, you know, I would say for, for gardens, social media is probably absolutely one of the best ways for you to share your information because you've always got great visuals. Um, so I, I believe in the, the power of social media. It's not, it's not the form of public relations that we practice, but it is a form of public relations that we run alongside when we have clients who see the value. But we also have some clients who just they, they don't see the value and uh, it, it does not work for them. So it really kind of depends on, on each individual place. Um, but you know, I'm a person who kind of straddles the line because it's not something that I personally love, but it's something that I professionally can see the value of, and I am supportive of you know, other social media teams doing their thing. Um, we feed a lot of information to social media teams. A lot of our press releases and blog posts and things get repurposed. So we're, we are content providers for a lot of the social media teams. We're just not actually doing the posts ourselves. Okay, um, and I think we have time for one more question. Um, how do you reply when associates from outside organizations ask you to share your media list? So, you know, it's interesting. I, this is very hard for me because I am a sharer and a generous person by nature, and I've had to learn in running my own PR agency, I don't share my list, even with clients. We don't share the list with clients unless or until the journalist is actually interacting with the client, in which case obviously we introduce them. But that is kind of a, a public relations agency standard. And um, my peers are like, no, 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 you will never share your list with clients. So we, that's, that's the rule that I have to follow. Um, I would say if you're talking about your peers, whether they are other, other facilities or whether they are you know, maybe other attractions in your destination, this is what I think. I mean, a list that I can just build incision, anyone can build it. And I sometimes will do that for a client. Like if they're like, hey, I need to know every blogger in the Midwest, we'll just quickly plug in decision, run a list, and give it to them. Because we don't have necessarily relationships with everybody on that list. That pr pr uh, the proprietary list I referred to, I would not share that with a soul. Because those are people that we have relationships with. And honestly, Probably if somebody else reached out to those people, they wouldn't even respond because they're like, why do you know me and why are you reaching out to me? So um, I am pretty protective of relationships, but I'm not necessarily protective of a generic list that I don't really have a strong connection to anyone on it. So I, 
that's a that's a tough call. It really kind of depends on the circumstances of the person who's asking the question. If it's somebody that you know and trust and, and you want to help them out and you have a list of maybe 25 media that are really key, maybe, maybe you, you do your friend a favor. But broadly, in general, I, I don't really believe in sharing the list because they are your contacts and you've worked really hard to develop those relationships and that's not something you necessarily just want to give away. Um, so I don't know if that's answered the question, but for the person who asked that question, you, you've got my contact information on this screen, and you know, you're welcome to reach out to me. And if I understood maybe your very specific circumstance, I might be able to give more definitive guidance there. Yeah, and I think that could also open an opportunity to maybe send you know, a joint pitch. You know, if it is um, you know, a, a partner organization, a sister garden, you know, that is interested in sending something, you know, maybe you team up and kind of send that information together to kind of build a meteor story. Absolutely. I mean, I'm a big fan of partnering, collaborating, working together. Um, but even that, you know, I, there have been some occasions where I've worked on a project with a friend that the friend has just said, you know, just send it to your list. Don't, like, I don't, I don't even need to see your list. Just send it to your list. Um, so I think there, there are positives and negatives to it. I am a, a person who really wants to help others. I really want to try to help others be as successful as they can be. Um, but then I also remember, gosh, you know, it took me a long time to forge these relationships. Um, I will say, you know, it's interesting because those relationships with the media are pretty much what we as public relations people are. And so the first job I left when I left the state of Maryland many, many years ago, I of course had these great lists of media contacts. And I actually asked our legal department, hey, like when I leave, I can take my list with me, right? Like because these are my media contacts and these are their email addresses and I'm allowed to take that list with me, right? And they said, yeah, they are your relationships. As long as you leave your list so that the next person taking your job has a starting point, you may absolutely take that list with you because they're your relationships. Great. Well, thank you so much, Mindy. Um, I think this was a great segue into, um, you know, kind of promoting your brand and how that can in turn create um, a great culture for your organization. So thank you so much. And um, you can see Mindy's information there on the screen. Um, so if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to Mindy. Thanks, everyone, and good luck with your public relations efforts. And um, we will be taking um, a short break, and we will be back at uh, 1 o'clock. So thanks, everyone, and we will see you soon.